the Lord has instructed me to continue our teaching about abundant overflow that Pastor Steve and I have learned from our dear friend, Jerry Savell. How many of you have been enjoying his teaching at the Southwest Believers Convention? Just really been wonderful about this is the year of firsts. First, and I can already attest that that has happened for me. I have turned an age I've never been before, a big one. And I went on a big, huge birthday vacation trip that I've never been on before. It's a year of first for me. And I believe it's a first spiritually for all of us. We're about to experience some firsts some recompense, some restoration. God is about to renew some things in our lives, renew some dreams that you thought that you had packed away. You're not too old. You're not past due. Amen. God has some things to accomplish through you. So tonight, I want us to look at this topic, how faith works. Now, this may seem very basic and elementary, and it is, because the things of God are not complicated. They are simple, but they're not easy. <laughs> no, they're not easy, or everybody would be doing this. Everybody would be living this way. But it works. Look at your neighbor and say, faith works. It works all the time. You see, according to the book of Romans, chapter 10, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and turn your Bibles there to Romans, chapter 10. According to the 10th chapter of Romans, faith comes by hearing, believing, and saying. That is how faith works. That is how faith works. Have you found Romans, chapter 10? Romans chapter 10, we're going to start reading at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee or near you. This is old English. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. So faith is in two places. Faith is in two places. Where is it, church? It's in your mouth and in your heart. Faith has to be in both places in order to work. It has to be in your mouth and in your heart, in your heart and in your mouth, in those two places. How does it get there? We're going to answer that question. How does it get in your mouth? How does it get in your heart? How does faith get there? It has to be in those two places, so how does it get there? The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, and he said, This is the word of faith which we preach. You know, some people think that Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland made up that phrase. But I got news for folks. The Apostle Paul wrote that <laughs> 2,000 years ago. This is the word of faith which we preach. And if it was good enough for Paul to preach, how many of you know it's good enough for us to preach? Amen. Amen. Let's read on. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we know, according to the scripture in Romans chapter 10, that this is how we are born again. We believe that God has raised Christ from the dead. Amen. We believe it where? In our heart. And we confess that with our mouth. And because we say it, the saying of it causes a supernatural occurrence and supernaturally we are born again of the Spirit of God. 
It happens on our inside. This is the word of faith which we preach. Verse 10, verses 10 and 11, let's read. For with the heart, heart and your mouth, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the, what, say it, mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Oh, yeah. Verse 12 and 13. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever, say whosoever, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad, church? That God is no respecter of persons, that he loves each and every one of us just the way we are, just the way he made us in our mother's womb. And he's called us. There's no distinction between the races with God. So all of this antichrist doctrine that's being spewed right now, it is demonic. Say it again, Leba. It's demonic. It's demonic. It's anti-Christ. God is not the author of confusion. So where there's confusion and strife, God's not in it. That's right. Amen. If you're confused about your gender, uh, g- give me camera three. If you're confused about your gender, God is not. He's not the author of confusion. He created XX chromosomes and XY chromosomes. There's not a multiplicity of genders. There's two. He created the species of man, just like the species of cow, just like the species of gorilla. And in gorilla, there's male and female. And in man, there's male and female. And the woman is the man with the womb. The woe man. We're the ones that carry the seed that's planted in us. See, God's really smart. And he's a lot smarter than woke liberals. I just wanted to tell you that right now. A lot smarter. Amen. That's enough of my soapbox. You know, I'm so happy that God loves each and every one of us in our diversities. Can I just tell you something? Many of you may not know this. I may be sharing something brand new with you tonight. Oh, aren't you blessed? (laughs) You know, I told you that years ago I found out that I have African in my DNA. And I wanted to prove it. I wanted to dive a little bit deeper because that was done through Ancestry.com. And um, for my birthday this year, my dear friend Daphne Swilling has real connections through all of her Indian ministry, you know, with the American Indians. They study genealogy. They're very into that. So with one of her tribal chiefs that has access to a really serious DNA research, took my Ancestry.com DNA and then some other things that we've done as a family and did a research for me. And Daphne said, get prepared to be very shocked. I went, okay, because I was ready for him to tell me, your, your African is so minimal, you know, just, you know, it's really not. I found out just the opposite. In fact, I found th- some things even more shocking. I found out, according to my pie chart, I'm a little over half European, white European, uh, English and Irish, a lot of Irish. But I'm a full third Sephardic, Hispanic Jew. I am amazed. A full third, not just a little bit. And the rest of the pie chart, I've got some Iranian and Afghanistan and Pakistan and then African. So I'm really a mutt. (laughs) 
And God created me that way. And he called me and set me apart and saved me, cleansed me from all darkness and all unrighteousness and filled me with the Holy Ghost and called me to preach. Wow. A woman. The man with the womb. Isn't God wonderful? Are you still in Romans chapter 10? Let's look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How does faith work? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and believing and saying. And how can they hear it unless a preacher that is called by God and anointed by God to preach this gospel under the power of the anointing for you to receive it in the anointing? How can you have faith come unless a preacher preaches it to you? That's what the Bible says, church. So it takes preachers, and not just any preachers. It takes preachers that are anointed and full of power and full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now turn with me. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 16 and 17. Is this okay? But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith, let's read it together. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith comes. Faith comes because under the anointed preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, revelation knowledge comes, impartation comes, instruction in righteousness comes, and faith gets built up. And you begin to receive it in a spirit of faith, and it gets planted and deposited into your spirit, and then you believe it, and you begin to say it. And when you say it, there is a supernatural release of God's Holy Ghost power. Amen. Amen. Say faith comes by hearing, believing, and saying. Now turn with me to Mark's gospel, chapter 11. And you know where I'm going with this, right? You know where we're going. Mark, chapter 11. We're going to start reading at the 22nd verse. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Look at me. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. You could also say this phrase the way it might have, well, probably already was originally written this way. Have the God kind of faith. Have the God kind of faith. What is the God kind of faith? Well, the God kind of faith says it, speaks it. How did God speak it? How did God say it? If you go back to the first book of the Bible, to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, you'll begin to read there, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God made, and there was. He separated the darkness from the light. He made the day and the night. He created all that you see. He said it, and then it manifest. So 
when Jesus said have faith in God, he was literally saying have the God kind of faith. Faith comes by hearing, believing, and saying. So you have to say it, right? Are we going somewhere with this? Amen. Now, Verse 23 says, be thou removed. Let's back up just a minute. For verily, look at verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, and Jesus pointed to a literal mountain. It wasn't figurative. It was a literal mountain. He said, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Can a mountain be removed by you just saying it? <laughs> it's a serious question. In the natural, no. In the law of physics, no. But Jesus was speaking to them about spiritual things. He said, if you say to that mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, let's just stop and break this down for a moment, shall we? Jesus said, if you would say to the mountain, be removed. Richard, he said, if you'd say to the mountain, be removed and not doubt in your heart that that mountain has to obey you. That's, that's what he said. Right, Pastor Hall? He said that. Now, does that mean that I can just say something? I can just, I, I can say to Barbara. Barbara, I'm going to come over to your house and I'm going to sweep your front porch. I don't do it. I just say I'm going to do it. I declared it. But I didn't do it. What was wrong with that? I might even believed I was going to do it. But I didn't act on what I said. Are you, are you understanding? Now, let's put it in the realm of the spirit. In, Keith Moore has been really hitting on this, too, and I love it because it addresses what we have traditionally called in our camp faith failures. Well, I, I, I said it, and nothing happened. Really? What scripture were you standing on? Well, I, I Googled it, and I had a scripture. Now, Pastor Liba, you understand this because of the fight that you've been through. My revelation will not work for you. You had to have your own revelation, same scriptures, same healing scriptures, same belief in God. We both love Jesus. We both love the word. But until those scriptures were a reality inside you, and it became more real than the illness. More real than the bad report. Until those scriptures became a revelation to you. Believing in your heart. You get where I'm going. You had to believe that word in your heart. And you declared. I was there. I was there on two different occasions. Uh, Andrew kind of conflated two different scenarios when he was testifying, but that's okay. The first time he and I had prearranged, we had discussed, we had the doctor's report, we knew where things were, and Andrew said, "You know, it. it you know, we were just talking the reality of the situation. Faith people do not deny the facts, and it's okay to discuss them." 
it is not okay for them to have authority. Do you see the difference? And so I prayed, and I wanted to make sure that Leba understood. She didn't have to fight this if she didn't want to. Andrew and I were giving her permission that if she didn't want to fight this, it was okay. And she was adamant, I'm believing God. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to have lungs. I'm going to have new lungs. And I'm going to be okay. I'm going to have this. This is going to happen. Okay. I'm with you. Where two agree, it's touching anything that they shall ask. It shall be done. And things progressed. You know, she was in the hospital months, months. That first time was in ICU. And then they moved her to the ward where she would be receiving her new lungs eventually. She didn't like being over there. She was not happy <laughs> when they moved you, Libra. You were not happy. <laughs> oh, my gosh, she was not happy. But I said, Andrew, but that's where she needs to be. He said, I know, I know. But she's just not happy. And I said, oh, well, we got to make her happy because she needs to be there. And, you know, you, it just seemed like it was taking forever. Because this fight of faith, I said it's simple, but it's not easy. It's hard. It's a challenge. Because the devil doesn't play fair, and he is persistent. He never stops. That's why you can't stop. You can't let up on your faith. You can't take a break. You can't take a faith break. Hey. Come on, somebody. So when that last time, like six days or so, before you received the lungs, I came into the, your room, and you didn't look good at all. I mean, as a pastor now for many years, Pastor Hall, you've probably seen this too. I saw the spirit of death on her. I mean, I've been there when several people have passed. So I know it. And I saw it. I didn't say it out loud, but Liba said, I read it all over your face. I could see it on your face. And... She looked at me, and she said, I will receive lungs. I am not going to die. God has something for me. My assignment isn't over. I want to live. I'm going to see my girls get married, and I'm going to finish what God has for me here. I went, okay. Amen. Amen. Where two or more agree is touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done. She got her new lungs. Now, I just want you to know, the faith fight Leba's been in, the whole Mowbray family's been in, our whole church family has been in. It was intended not just to take her out, but to take the family out and to take the church family out. The devil doesn't play fair. So we had to keep fighting that good fight of faith. How does faith come? By hearing the anointed preaching. You never heard Pastor Steve and me get in the pulpit and say, well, it ain't looking good. I don't know. I don't know. Did you ever hear us say anything like that? You never heard us say anything but all I see is victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what we declared. Because faith comes by hearing. We kept preaching the word of faith that, that has gotten us to where we are. We're prospering. We're blessed. We're healed in our bodies. We're successful, praise the Lord. The same word of faith that we've always preached. We just keep preaching and we never back down. Never compromise, not for a minute. I don't care who takes a left turn and wants to do something else. 
I don't care if somebody says, well, you know, that word of faith stuff, that was yesterday. You know, we're, we're moving on. Well, you can move on if you want to, honey. I am standing where God placed me, and I'm not moving. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm willing to go with God. Whatever, wherever God's going, I'm going with him. Yes. But if the word of faith that we preach was good for Paul, <laughs> it's still good for Cheryl Ingram, Amen. the Sephardic Jew. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Glory to God. I'm preaching pretty good right now. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 23. This is important. This is important because faith comes by hearing, believing, and saying. Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the profession, or that word should be confession, of our faith without wavering. Pastor Libby, did you want to waver? There were many times you didn't feel like it. You, you wanted to say, I forget it. Oh, I don't feel like it. But you weren't moved by how you felt. You just kept believing and you kept saying. For he is faithful that promised. Say it with me, church. For he is faithful that promised. God's promises are yes and amen. That's how faith works. Now, in the last few minutes that I have, I want to talk about how to operate in faith. How to operate in faith. How do we function? How do we live our everyday lives? Going to the grocery store. Coming home, unloading the groceries, pumping gas in the car, going to work, being a good employee or being a good boss, being a good school teacher. How do we operate in faith? You ready for this? First of all, you define your need. Define your need. What is it you're believing for? Define your need. You know, some people say, well, you know, I'm believing. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe. You know, I'm a believing believer. <laughs> and I believe. Well, what do you believe? Well, you know, I believe. You know, the word. Because I'm a word person. We're faith people. We believe. What do you believe? Well, you know. It's silly things. But you hear that. What is your need? Well, I don't feel good. Where? Well, I don't know exactly. I just don't feel good. Well, you need to know. What did I tell you through this whole process? We have to have the right doctors to determine what is wrong. How many doctors did you go to, Liba? And you didn't know. And they misdiagnosed. Numerous times. You know, because, you know, I said that doctors are practicing. I don't want them practicing on me. I want them to know. <laughs> so we pray for the right doctor. Who knows? And so we had to believe God. We had to get over that hurdle first. What is it? We had to know the need. What is it called? Because Jesus is the name that is higher than any name that can be named. So if you can name the need, Jesus is higher than the need. Come on, church. Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you define the need. Then what do you do? After you know what the need is, you got to find God's will. How do you find God's will? Well, Lord, if it be thy will to heal me. Well, it's his will. It's always his will. 
It is not his will for you to be sick and hurt and in pain or be in lack and not have enough money to pay your bills. That's never God's will. And who, whoever uh, misguided you or taught you wrongly, you got to get that out of your thinking. God is not a mean ogre sitting on a throne just ready to zap you. He's a loving Father God. He is ready to bless you. He's ready to heal you. We live in this awful fallen world. We're susceptible to stupid demonic viruses. They come from the pit, you know. It might have been in a lab originally, COVID-19. They might have been playing with stupid bats. What's wrong with people? I just want to know, what is wrong with you? Why are you messing with bats in the first place? And then let it leak from a lab? Yeah, somebody said they didn't let it. It was, well, that's another story. Okay. It's demonic, whatever it is. It isn't God's will for us to be susceptible to COVID. Somebody asked me today online, they said, what does Brother Copeland and Jerry have to say about taking the vaccination? I said, well, I haven't spoken with them in particular about the vaccination, the vaccine. But I can tell you what Pastor Steve and I are encouraging people. Are you ready to hear this? Of course, when this COVID thing first hit, the pandemic, we stood on Psalm 91, didn't we? We all took our inoculations right here in this room. We stood up and we claimed Psalm 91 and we said, no plague shall come nigh our dwelling place. And we believed God for that virus not to touch us. Amen. I said, you can believe Psalm 91 if you don't want to receive the vaccine. Just believe, God, that plague's not coming in your body. And if you want to take the vaccine, come on, it isn't a sin. It's not the mark of the beast. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things. It's not a sin to take it. Is it wise? I don't know. There's lots of studies that say there's things in it. You shouldn't take it. But if you decide to take the vaccine or you're forced to take it. I just heard today that President Biden is going to force our military to take it. If you're forced to, here's what you do. Mark 16, 18 says, and if you ingest any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. You see, you go find the word that applies to your need and you can't just say it. Well, I thought you said you believe it in your heart. There you go. You hear it. You believe it in your heart. See, if it's not a revelation inside you, John and Barbara, if that word is not a revelation on your inside, it's just words to you. You're just saying words. And this is where people miss it. They say words that other people have said, and they get into presumption and not faith. And that's where we call that a faith failure. Because it hasn't been a revelation to them. They're just saying words. But you believe it. You say it until it's a revelation. Didn't, didn't those scriptures become a revelation to you, Leba? It, it, it's just second nature. You just believe it. Nobody can talk you out of it. You believe that. So when I said that, either way, you're going to stand on the word. You're going to be in faith believing whether you take the vaccine or not. No deadly thing is coming in my body. And if I take the vaccine, if there's a deadly thing in it, it's just not going to work on me. It, it won't affect me. No, because I got antibodies for that. I got the Holy Ghost inside me, and greater is he that's in me than he that's in that vaccine or COVID. That's really good preaching right there. So 
you got to know God's will on it. And then you ask in faith, believing. Ask in faith, believing. You don't just say, please, 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 God. Oh, God, oh, please, 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 please. I don't know what I'm going to do if you don't do this. Oh, please, please, please. That is not faith believing. That is operating in fear in your natural man. And that fear does not move God. Does he love you? He loves you. But let's turn it on you. When your kids were two years old, Shut up. I want, I want, I want. Shut up. That's what some grown people sound like to God. That is not asking in faith, believing. A believing believer says, God, your word says that by your stripes I was healed. So if I was, I am now. So I receive that word, and it becomes an enlightenment on your inside. Oh, I'm healed. Oh, yeah, my body may not see it right now, but in here, I'm already healed. Isn't that right, Liba? I I'm helping people. I know this is basic, but some people, you know, it's just gone right over their head. There's some people that have been Word of Faith churches for years and don't know what I'm telling you right now. It has not become a reality to them. Amen. It's in here. You just know it. You know it. You know it. And you know, the longer you, you walk in that and it becomes more real, the faster it comes. The faster the manifestation happens. Look at Mark 11.24. You still got your Bibles, right? Mark 11.24. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Amen. Believing. Saying. Corresponding action. And then what do you do, church? You just stand on that word. It's become a revelation. You just begin to praise God. You just begin to say, Lord, I just praise you and thank you. I know I'm the healed. Lord, I need, I need that financial breakthrough. I need that to happen, Lord. And God, I'm, t I'm a tither. I just want to remind you that I'm claiming tither's rights. I I'm claiming my rights as a tithing covenant member. And Lord, I've been faithful to sow. And I just want to remind you that you said that, that if I would tithe, you would open up the windows of heaven for me. That becomes a revelation on your inside. It's not just words. It's not just words that you recited in Sunday school and you memorized. Hello? It's a revelation on your inside. You know it. So you just begin to praise God and thank him. You just begin to praise the Lord. Look at 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, what's his will? His word. His word is his will. So if we ask according to the word, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, verse 15, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So what do you do? You just begin to praise God and thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, I'm healed. Thank you, Lord, I have my financial breakthrough. Thank you, Lord, my kids are saved. My kids are serving you. My kids are filled with the Holy Ghost. I rebuke drugs off of my kids in Jesus' name. They're serving the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And you never, look at me, church. You never let words of doubt and unbelief come out of your mouth. And if you should let something slip, immediately go, oh, I repent for that. Lord, 
Don't hold me to that. I repent. I, I bind those words in Jesus' name. Whatever's bound on earth is bound in heaven, so I bind them right now. And correct it. Amen. That's how powerful your words are. Are you getting anything out of this? That's how powerful our words are, church. And lastly, let me share this with you. Faith. This is how faith works, how we operate in faith. Faith considers the matter settled. It's done. It's over. That's the word of faith that we preach. Well, you name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it, people, and you're just so hard-nosed about it. Well, we're living in victory. Hey, I'd much rather be in this camp than in some camp that's full of COVID right now. Or some camp that is in terror over what's happening in our culture. I'm not worried about it. You're not. But pastor, it's bad. Well, the Bible says it would get that way. And God trusts us enough to live right now. Amen. If God entrusted you to be here, you wouldn't be here. But you're here. Did you get anything out of this tonight? How faith works. Well, I preach myself happy. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just receive your word with gladness tonight. I thank you, Lord, that faith people will arise. We're going to help our families. We're going to help our communities. We're going to help those that we love to serve you, to know you. And to live this victorious life that we're living. You know, living in faith doesn't mean that you never have a challenge. Just the opposite. Satan attacks who he's afraid of. <laughs> if you're being attacked, he's in fear of you. Amen. Don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of an attack. It's not fun. I mean, nobody wants to go through it. But God thinks enough of you that you can handle it. He's, he's, really, he's really proud of you. You're growing. You're increasing. God's doing a work in you that you never thought would happen. It's exceeding your wildest expectation. And we say that's Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do exceeding abundance. Exceeding abundance. Not exceedingly abundantly. He exceeds abundance. That's so huge we can't. We can't wrap our minds around how big that is. And God says the power for that is in you. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah, Lord, we receive it. We receive it. We receive it. Thank you, Lord. Oh, just lift your hands and begin to praise God. Come on, you're going to have to just let God know how much you love him and how much you appreciate him for the word that he's deposited in us tonight. Thank you, Lord, that faith works, and it's working in each of us. Say, it's working in me. It's working in me. Yes. Oh, yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right in the household of faith.